All right, everybody, uh, I'm going to get started. Um, I made a bet with one of my friends that there'd be more people in here at the Starbucks line. And I think I'm going to be a, I think I might slightly win. We'll see how many people come in. So I'm Dan Imler. I'm a PEM doc. I also am a hospitalist. I do both things. Um, I also do clinical informatics as well. And I'm big, my big interest in life is around clinical decision making and how um, technology affects that. So what are we going to do here today in this, in this room? So we're going to understand kind of some of the evidence around clinical algorithms. We're going to talk about some of the potential problems, some of the opportunities about using algorithms as a teaching tool. Okay? And then we're going to kind of demonstrate and go through like a little practice of being able to understand how we can use that algorithm as that tool, um, because I think there is a lot of opportunity to use these new things to help out with that. Obviously, at the end, we'll, we can have a little time if you guys want to talk about some of the new um, types of algorithms as well that might be relevant. So, I started residency in 2003, and when I did that, when I would go to the bedside, um, it would almost always be with an attending when we make our decision. And this was, I think, for a lot of us, that initial kind of practice where we spent time talking about a patient. We, we'd be back and forth with the attending or with some other um, uh, senior expert and try to understand what's going on maybe with this patient with right lower quadrant. But I think for many of you, and what happens in our, um, our shop in Stanford is, a lot of the time, the first thing that happens when you start thinking about something is someone just pulls out whatever the clinical pathway is for that. Um, that might be different at different organizations. Ours and many, I think, of the other uh, academic medical centers have come up with algorithmic responses to almost everything. So when I'm sitting in our kind of um, doc box and a new patient comes in, I immediately can look over and see, hey, the resident is looking through this algorithm. And to be honest, uh, without um, having a lot of necessarily input into these algorithms, suddenly all the care that's being provided on my patients is being determined by somebody else or some other system. So I think it's actually really important to think about that. And this is not something that's going away. It's becoming more and more prevalent. This is actually looking at cl clinical um, um, practice guidelines and the, um, and the rate of growth of them. And I think this is actually way underestimating that growth rate that's happening. It's kind of exponentially we're going to see that. And I can tell you from seeing a lot of other stuff in industry, that it's going to come in even a much bigger way in the near future as value-based care becomes more relevant to the emergency department. So what am I talking about when I talk about an algorithm? So there's many different things that can be considered algorithms. Basically, any standard logic-based approach to making decisions, right? That might be CPGs, which get published. It might be 100 pages long. Maybe that's the clinical pathway group. Clinical calculators, they're also kind of an algorithmic response to doing it, just doing it with math. Chatbots have become more and more prevalent. Um, Order sets are a classic thing, and then reference, just even just within text, it's kind of often telling you how to go through things. Now, you know, it's really hot right now to talk about the large language models and how they're an algorithmic response to that. I'm not going to kind of touch on them quite as much today. We can talk about maybe them a little bit at the end because there are slightly different things associated with them, but they are also a, a somewhat algorithmic response to making decisions. So why are they everywhere all of a sudden? And there's a couple of reasons, but the big reason is they're kind of proven to work. They actually do make a lot of things better, sort of. So there is good evidence that they do decrease va variation. They standardize clinical care, which is, we all know is fairly important. They improve adherence. So not only do you decrease the variance, but you also improve the, the, um, the precision of that um, medical decision. They do have been shown pretty well to actually limit util overutilization of resources. Um, they have been shown to improve antibiotic as well as other medication stewardship pro processes inside hospitals. And one of the big things that they do is they actually allow generalists, um, trainees, and other non-physicians, people who may not have classically made clinical decisions, to actually carry out complex and expert tasks. So that may be a good example of that is triage order sets or triage pathways that you may have in your organization where a nurse is actually creating orders and doing clinical decisions that typically would have been done by a physician, but now algorithmically can be done that. And probably the biggest reason, and I think the big reason why you're going to see a lot more of this is this last point, because it basically gives you a reproducible lever for the healthcare system itself to impact clinical um, metrics and financial metrics and operational metrics. And when I talk about um, value-based care, I often will just talk about value-based metrics, because value-based care, even though we generally think of it as this kind of quality over cost kind of model, Really what comes out in our day-to-day -day life are actually metrics because to actually reimburse value-based care, you have to have something that you're reimbursing on. That thing that you're reimbursing on is metrics. That's what hospital cares about. They care about metrics, right? 
one of the very few things that have actually been changed, shown to change metrics are actually um, algorithmic responses to clinical decision making. All of the pay for performance, all of these other classic things have not actually changed those metrics all that much, but algorithms have. So now algorithms are everywhere. So let's say you're sitting in your ED and this eight-year-old, the female, with the first time wheezing shows up. And the first thing your, all your residents do that you know is the right thing to do is grab that asthma pathway. Now you're just going to go down that asthma pathway. Right? Well, there's a lot of things on that asthma pathway, right? And they may walk through and say immediately, okay, I'm going through, now I'm going to use the uh, respiratory score to understand where I am. That's a calculator inside of a pathway, right? Now I'm going to use this other part that moves over other things. And they move down, suddenly the patient's on continuous albuterol getting atroventin steroids, and they're moving along this pathway. But the problem with that is that there's a lot of other things that could be potentially going on with this patient. Maybe this is an eight-year-old with first time wheezing. Wait a second, that's not common, right? Usually kids wheeze, they wheeze when they're younger, right? So is this my, the first presentation of myocarditis, right? Is this a mediastinal mass that we're going to give steroids to and change their risk profile from, of ALL from a 95 to 97% cure rate to suddenly an 85%? Just one day cure rate, right? There's r true impacts that if we just follow this algorithmic response without thinking about it, could really have a, a big impact on that patient. What if this is a heart transplant patient? Like, can I use this algorithm on a heart transplant patient? Like, maybe, maybe not. W the resin's going to be confused. They don't really know what they're doing. Maybe they're going to start it. What about the fact that we're all in an albuterol shortage right now, and maybe we need to use different methods, but in this algorithm that was published two and a half years ago, right, they're just like, there's the assumption that albuterol is everywhere, right? And what if the previous resident didn't start on the pathway? They, they, they just started doing whatever they wanted, and it didn't make sense in the top. Because most of these clinical pathways, especially ones in the ED, tend to be very linear in progress. So what if you start, what if you're not at the top, right? What do you do then? So a lot of them can get very confused. And there's a lot of risks associated with using these algorithms. So the first is, is it up to date? Um, I know recently I looked at a very large uh, hospital system who's very well, um, has a very high reputation for clinical effectiveness, and a majority of their clinical pathways were over eight years old. Uh, it's just you know, you create an asthma pathway, everybody's like, oh, you know, the first thing that usually happens is there's an RCA on some bad event, right? Then you create a clinical pathway as the solution to that problem, right? And you publish that clinical pathway after it's gone through P&T and a all these different committees, and then it goes up on your internet, and oh, now nobody thinks about it for the next 10 years until there's another RCA associated with that clinical pathway, right? Is this the right algorithm for this particular patient's content, right? Most of these algorithms are written in a very generalized content because they can't create an algorithm for everybody, right? So they create a very generalized algorithm, and then you have to decide, hey, is this actually for this patient? And this is this idea that they've made this average, pa uh, average one, but what about if this individual itself? Does it re reflect the values of this particular patient? The one that gets me right now is my wife just started working as a concierge gynecologist, and there's a lot of inside of all these pathways, and a lot of our other recommendations are decisions made on price sensitivity. How, how, well, how well do we, how do we need to include cost effectiveness within the decision making? Well, if we make that on a generalized level, maybe that doesn't affect this individual who's worth a billion dollars, right? Maybe they're willing to actually pay more money to decrease their risk from 1% to 0.5%, where on a generalized population that doesn't make sense, right? What were the inherent biases when this algorithm was created? A lot of these algorithms have all sorts of biases baked into them. Right. We recently got rid of race inside of a lot of the UPI um, uh, algorithms in pediatrics, but many of the other ones have many other things like gender, um, uh, race, and many other parts of uh, intrinsic biases. Um, a lot of those biases are based on where they were made. So a lot of them are made in academic medical centers, and then they're supposed to translate into a community medical center, and that just doesn't work because resources might not be the same. All sorts of things might have been different. So um, all those things matter. What about uh, the fact that a vast majority of our patients don't have just one problem, right? They often have many problems. Or the problem that they come in with is not necessarily fitting within a, a particular context. It's easy. There's a 14-year-old who comes in with right lower quadrant pain. They've been vomiting. They have a fever. Okay, I'm worried about appendicitis. But what about the 4-year-old who shows up who just has generalized abdominal pain and grew up once and hasn't had a fever? Like, can you use it? the appendicitis algorithm on that patient? Like, what are you actually using it for in this different patient? And then what about when there's guidelines that conflict? And this happens all of the time, especially if you're not using one space around your organization, because many of the different academies actually publish 
pathways that conflict with each other. And if you just start following one, you don't realize, oh, maybe I'm not doing what some other groups thought I should be doing. What group should I follow? So I think when I think about this as an educator, um, I do think that there is the opportunity here, as we've seen a lot of these clinical algorithms and things, to come in with a new way to approach them in terms of teaching some of the, some of the things that exist in them. Because the hospital system, for pretty good reasons, are going to push them. Right? They probably do improve care, so they are going to be part of our lives. But what we teach around them can really impact, I think, their impact. So what are we really trying to treat, teach when we teach about these things? In, in my mind, this is really about sort of a roadmap for this clinician to get to clinical excellence. Right? How can I get them to create a model of, their war, of, the, of these patients that's going to get them the correct answer majority of the time? And then also, and I think this is becoming more and more important as we're sort of at this inflection point of what a clinician is going to do in their clinical decision making in the future, is what is the unique value that we as physicians actually provide to this patient experience, right? In the past, I think that was different than it is now, and I think it's going to be vastly different than it is in the near future. And part of that is my third point, is what does it actually mean to work with logic? Right? In the past, we usually thought of logic as just in our brain, but now we're using external logic. And a lot of that time, that can be codified into a machine that is actually providing that logic for us. So the classic example for me in that is chess. So there used to be Gary Kasparov, who just within his own brain could create his own model of the world and then use that to develop chess. Right? But then we realized, oh, an algorithmic response to chess is actually superior to his model of the world. And he got beat. But what often isn't in the story is that there was actually another phase after that, was there's something called freestyle chess now, where there's actually um, relative experts of chess, not Gary Kasparov level chess players, but relatively amateur chess players that are actually winning all the tournaments now with the human plus the machine and making those decisions. And you can see that that's where I personally think that we're going to move in a lot of these algorithmic decision making. And if we can't teach our residents and trainees how to do that, I think they're going to fall behind in terms of what's possible. So I'd love to take just a minute or two for everybody to just think of in their own um, practice how they might use a clinical pathway. So a patient shows up, a six-week-old, I see these all the time, right, shows up with a fever, otherwise healthy kid, right? And here's the clinical pathway of your organization, or they pull up this one, this um, Children's Hospital um, of Philadelphia, right? So just think for a second, okay, the resident's got this open on their, on their desk. What are you going to tell them when you peek over and realize they're starting all of the process of your own case? Just think about it for like a minute or two, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So my suggestion on this is that the first question I would always ask them is, is this algorithm even reliable? Or like, where is it not reliable? What is this thing that you have open? Where did it come from? Why, did, why do you have it open at all? And I think a lot of the times you can actually get through a lot of, uh, get them into a, this framework of what we classically thought of evaluating the validity of a paper, right? I think you should also go through that same process of evaluating the validity of what you're actually using. And maybe you don't have to do that the fifth time that you've used this algorithm, but at least sometime you should have to actually look to say, why is this tool relevant for me? And is it something I can count on? And then the second question I would ask, I ask them is, okay, you're looking at this thing. What context are you in? Is this thing actually relatable to the current context that you're in? Does this patient actually match what you're actually trying to accomplish with this algorithm? Um, and, and is it, for this particular patient, is it, is it, is it something that we think that can be relevant to them? Um, then I'd ask them, what are some of those assumptions that this algorithm is making that may or may not be true in this particular situation, right? Is the data that they made this algorithm valid at all? Where did this come from? Is this just out of your urologist's head who made something up? Is this from some sort of paper? What were those papers? What are so basically getting to understand what is this? thing that I'm using, right? Not, I'm just going to use this and use type 2 thinking and just quickly 
go off and just move on to the next patient, at least when you start to use any tool, you just really determine what that tool is, right? So most of other technicians in the rest of the world, surgeons and other people, when they start to work with a new tool, they have to, they don't, they don't just like start using it necessarily. They have to understand what this tool is, where does it come from, why do I use it, when should I use it, when should I not use it? And I think a lot of the times in our kind of rapid paced world, people are just very quickly moving into using rather than understanding. So what other outcomes are possible to, to simulate? So I love doing this with that, with that, clinic, that um, training as well to say, okay, now you're in this situation with this patient. Let's give you a slightly different patient in this, in this situation. How would this algorithm react differently? Where is it going to break down? What is the edge case of that? And then where in, along this algorithm are you tripping up that we can then jump off to have a discussion about it? And that doesn't have to be a 30-minute discussion, right? That can be a two-minute discussion about why we're doing particular things. So I'll give you an example on this case we were doing before. So here's some of the questions that I would ask this one. Once again, where did this algorithm come from? Okay, it's CHOP pathway. Who it CHOP? Why it CHOP? Why am I using CHOP? I look at Stanford, right? Why is this relevant in this situation? Do we have one? Oh, we do have one of these. Oh, is it, re is it ready for prime time? Oh, actually, it's based on the old recommendations. These recommendations that they're using here just came out within the last year. Okay. so. We're moving down here, okay, it's saying consider LP. Well, what happens if we don't get the LP? It doesn't tell me what to do if I miss the LP, right? Do I just keep sticking the kid until I, until I completely pincushion their back and like don't get any fluid or I finally get bloody fluid? What do I do? What if the family says I can't do an LP, right? That's in the algorithm, like suddenly like I'm in a blocker, I can't move on. Like, and I've seen a lot of residents just like freeze in that moment because they're so used to just following things. What if this patient has a complex medical patient, uh, history? Almost all clinical pathways assume that there's basically nothing else going on except the problem that you're dealing with, right? What if they came just from Sub-Saharan Africa? Does this change what you're thinking about? Okay, the underlying population that this was all do done on were primarily white children in New England, right? So like, how does that relevant to a person who just recently came from Sub-Saharan Africa? Maybe that is a completely different algorithm that we should be approaching. Okay, I have a typo here, but okay, we're down here at the bottom. What if the UA is positive, but the inflammatory mar markers are negative? Like, what are these edge cases with things that most people would assume, oh, if the UA is positive, the inflammatory markers are probably going to be positive too, blah, 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 but that's not always true. One or two percent of the time, they're going to be normal. Can I do something different in that situation? And then it's making assumptions up here, and I love to dig in on ones where it's our clinical gestalt is the decision point, because a lot of times, the, the people who create these algorithms, myself included, just assume that you're like a season dependent in your ability to assess this patient. Because to me and some of my other colleagues, an ill appearing, okay, probably 99% of the time that's going to be the same patient. But to a resident, what does it actually mean to be ill appearing, especially when I'm fo primarily following a, a chart, right? And then what if certain things inside of this thing aren't possible anymore? So this is that kind of simulation that I was talking about of that other patient. Yeah, most of the time, the patient, and I'll show that in a second, most of the time they're going to meet this. But there's a lot of times that they're not. So what if all of a sudden we can't get any antibiotics? I know our clinical pathway at home for this exact thing basically shows, tells them to give cep um, cefotaxin at the end. Well, cefotaxin's on short. I can't get it right now. What, what the heck do I use? Can I use ampingen? Do I still need to use amp even though blah, 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 all the things down that line. So, what I'm kind of getting at is that the value of the clinicians in this future state with algorithms there is probably primarily at the edge. Yes, most of these algorithms function very well for the vast majority of generalized central patients that it was intended to be created for. However, out here on the margins, they tend to break down very easily. And I think this is where clinician, uh, physicians specifically are going to live in the future. We're going to live in the edge case because the majority of the general patients that come in are going to fit that algorithm pretty well. They're going to fly right through it and then click it, move on to the next one, right? So that's not really providing a lot of value to each one of those cases. I typically will tell my residents somewhat facetiously that I think I only I only like add true value to maybe one to two percent of the patients that actually show up on each shift, right? And that's okay, right? That's actually okay, right? But we should understand that and and train for where our value actually is. Okay? And I think the aircraft in industry is a good model for actually how they've done this as well. Aircraft has been automated for very long periods of time. They've had algorithmic approaches to lots of things. So there's a, re a recent kind of book that kind of talked about this a little bit, and it gave two different scenarios. Basically, both of them, some 
catastrophic failure was happening with the airplane, right? And when that happens, uh, the, the airplane starts alerting, right? So in one case, there was a ton of alerts going off in the cockpit, and the, air, and the pilots were trying to go through and figure out how each alert related to what, their, what was going on, and they just basically focused on the facts that were in front of them and really focused on those alerts and how they needed to move to the next step in the algorithm based on the alert that was in front of them, right? That plane smashed into a mountain, right? Versus the different one where the very similar situation happened in the airplane. Um, but instead of focusing on all the alerts that they could not wrap their mind around in that period of time, they basically stepped back to their mental model of what an airplane was and stepped through, okay, let's not focus on all the alerts that are coming at me, all this information that I don't understand and all this algorithmic kind of, of knowledge is coming at me. Let me just understand how I approach flying an airplane and step through that process until I can figure out how I can get my plane back. Right? I think a very similar thing is going to happen, maybe not in the quite that acute, um, fast period, but basically I think that the we're not training our residents the same as we potentially could by not focusing on what's the mental model of how an asthmatic person is. Why is that patient reason? Right? What is reason? Why does a patient wheeze in the first place? Okay. Why, why is interception an intermittent abdominal pain? Right? Okay. So it's because, I don't know, like they hurt once in a while. No, that's actually it. Okay, why is it? Oh, it's because it's intercepting. It's coming in and out. Well, that's actually not true in ileocolic interception. Usually it stays there the whole time. Well, what's going on in your belly? Okay, something happens intermittently. Oh, that's peristalsis that happens. Oh, it's intermittent ischemic peristalsis with interception. Oh, that must be why they're bleeding, and on and on and on. And suddenly you have this understanding of why that clinical process is going on, so that when you hit those edge cases out there, where all of a sudden it's not quite right, right? They start, they have a model for what that is. And I'll finish here, but basically this is my kind of perception of where we're going with all of this and how we might happen. So in the past, I, re I really relate how clinical medicine is happening. It's very similar to the auto industry. So at the beginning of the auto industry, the beginning of medi um, mo modern Western medicine, it was very much that the single person created everything. The, the guy who created the first model, he didn't just build the tire. Right? He built the entire thing. He had a model for his, in his head of exactly how a car might function, right? And created that model, and therefore, if anything went wrong with his thing, he knew exactly in his model how to approach that, all right? But then we kind of moved on to the next phase of the auto industry, which is really mass production, right? And I think this is where we are with clinical medicine right now. Everybody has a specific job within that, that train that they're going after, and they're algorithmically going through it. We are in charge of the emergency mass aspect of this patient. We're not in charge of all the other aspects of this patient, just the emergency aspect of that patient, right? And we have an algorithm for doing each part of it. Okay, I need to move up, left, tighten this bolt, move this way, and do this, right? But if anything goes wrong, it's very tough for us to understand exactly what's going on. And as machines get better and better at it, suddenly all those algorithmic tasks, those can be codified. What is our true value in the future? And I think of that as like, um, one of my friends was recently doing a video at the Tesla auto plant, he showed me some of the video, and it was fascinating, right? When you look at video, he was showing me the videos of uh, old um, uh, Ford plants, and there was just a plethora of people in the, in the screen, people everywhere. But when you showed the Tesla one, there was basically no people, right? They're all robots doing it. And when you look at the people who actually work for Tesla in their auto plants, it's all PhD engineers, right? So their value, once again, has moved from the actually the turning the spoke and doing the secretarial work of medicine that we typically do now to really fixing the machines that are doing primarily the, the, that everyday repetitive work. And I think that's where we're going with uh, emergency medicine as well, medicine in general, um, where we're going to spend most of our time, or there may be less of us doing that, but there'll be most of our time we'll be living in those edge cases. So in my mind, take those algorithmic, when, you're, when your resident picks up that pathway to look at stuff, spend the time making sure they understand what exists inside of that pathway, rather than um, how to get to the next phase. Happy to answer any questions. Once again, I didn't talk about large language models, but there's many other issues associated with them as well. Great. Oh, question in the back.
Yeah, so I picture, uh, m when I think of algorithms, algorithms are a way to, 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 to create action in the world without thinking. It's my way of typically thinking of an algorithm, right? So the most classic one we have in emergency medicine, right? When you walk, I always give, give this example to residents, is when you walk into a code, right, and you can't think, that's a great situation for an algorithm, right? Because the first algorithm in, in a code is ABC, right? And that gets onto your next algorithm, allows you to actually think. So I do think that there's roles for it, but it's primarily when it's a repeatable, um, uh, generalized situation, not when it's specific at all. 